I believe we are. Okay, very good. Well, thanks everybody for showing up tonight. It's, uh, I think the last time I looked, there's like 21 people or so. That's, that's great. Um, and uh, this, this came about, uh, it started uh, with, so we needed a, we're looking for a chapter presentation for the month of April. And uh, Kirk had done some uh, research on, on the famous uh, signs that the sign that sits outside of Gleason uh, proudly proclaiming that it is the trout fishing capital of the world. I remember the first time I saw that sign, um, I had, uh, let me see here, something, I gotta do something here. All right. Uh, the, the, the very first time that I saw the sign, it was several, many years ago, and I was, on, I was living in Wausau, and I had a meeting up in Rhinelander, and I was driving down the road, and we're just south of Blueville. I look up, and there's this sign which boldly proclaims that the Gleason area is the trout fishing capital of the world. Um, I, I promptly about ran off the road because I started laughing so hard, thinking, my goodness, you know, uh, Gleason area could be the trout fishing capital of the world. I'm sure that uh, there's places in Montana and Wyoming and New Zealand, even uh, some areas here in Wisconsin that would, would really take issue with that. Um, but, you know, the more that I thought about that, uh, the more I came to realize that, you know, when we think about uh, what <laughs> the important places for us, um, if you, the place that is your home, your home waters for you becomes that capital, that trout fishing capital of the world. And uh, after, after leaving Wausau and moving up in this neck of the woods, I've come to understand a little bit of the pride that uh, the Gleason area has uh, in, in, in this particular uh, setup here. So what we're gonna do tonight, we have, we have assembled a, a, you know, a panel of experts not at all. Uh, the, only, the only thing that uh, we have going for us is, is the fact that we were willing to do a little research and put something out here. Um, so there are people that are watching this tonight and, and doing this with us that I'm sure know a lot more than we do. Uh, so there is going to be an opportunity if you have questions uh, or if you have uh, criticisms or you say, wait a minute, let's talk about this. All you need to do is to use the chat function on Zoom. And uh, Kirk is going to be monitoring that and he will uh, interrupt uh, what I'm doing and we'll do the same for him and for Patrick when we're doing it. Um, what we're going to do tonight is, is we're going to do, I'm going to start out with a history and overview of the Prairie River watershed. Um, and just, just basically give you, for those of you that aren't familiar with the area, at least give you an overview of, of the river itself and some of its attributes. Then we're going to look at uh, what is the state record brook trout listed in the, uh, in the Freshwater Fishing Hall of Fame and also on the state records uh, that was caught in this watershed. So we, we have a little bit of bragging to do when it comes to, uh, to, our, uh, to our chapter in that. Then Kirk, uh, Kirk did some research on the signs, the one that about I drove off the road laughing when I first saw, uh, but he will be, he'll be filling us in on some information and uh, he was able to interview, you know, some of the teachers and those folks that, that worked at getting those signs together. Uh, then we have Patrick Hager with us tonight. Patrick is, uh, uh, is going to talk about the history of the Friends of the Prairie River, and uh, he's got a lot of lot of things to share with that with us. And Patrick was one of the organizers of that group, and uh, it's great. To, uh, and he's been a a long time uh, TU member or chapter member as well. And also, he's going to talk about the bugs. He's he he has something a website that's called WisconsinFlyFishing.com. And on it, he's, he has uh, maintained a hatch chart on there, and he has a, he has a real love and fascination for in, you know, the bugs. Um, so we, what, what we're going to do, we're going to include all of you as well at the end of it, if anybody's still there after our drivel is done. Um, we, we have a question for you. And, uh, and after you, in, in something you can mull over as you're going through. If you had to fish the Prairie River, with only three flies for the entire season, okay? And, I, and it can be, and it doesn't have to be flies, you know, it can be a MEPS number three, you know, you know, black and yellow if you want. 
Uh, if you can have three things you could fish the prairie with uh, for the entire season, what would they be and why? So that's going to be your participation. We've included all of you as experts in this as well, even if you've never been on the river at all. Okay. Tonight, we're going to explore that claim that it is the trout fishing capital of the world with Kirk and uh, Kirk Start, Patrick, Henry, and myself. And then again, at the end, we're going to have you experts uh, call in. Okay, so let's take a look at the prairie a little bit. The prairie, basically, the watershed is divided in two sections. Uh, historically, it has been described as two distinct sections, and the dividing line is always the village of Gleason on Highway 17. Now, for those of you that don't know Highway 17, it is the road which runs uh, between uh, Merrill, uh, Highway 64 and Merrill, up to the city of Rhinelander and, uh, and beyond. But uh, Dudley, uh, I mean, Gleason is a, is a small village about halfway in between. Now, the upper section of the prairie is uh, normally uh, been described in and shown to be that area which is narrower, brushier, and faster water. And that really is a generalization because the, in, in, that, in those upper stretches uh, from Gleason North, uh, there, there is a wide variety of, uh, of, of the way in which this, uh, this, this watershed presents itself. Um, it, is, it is an accurate gen generalization, I think, but it also, th this stretch of water also, also possesses most characteristics of, of some of the lower parts of the thing. It also has pools and runs, the traditional pools and runs and riffles. Um, it is, a, again, primarily a little brushier as this picture would show. This is kind of in the upper stretches of it. Um, so this is not an unusual look at the upper prairie. Uh, but it can also can have some pretty wide open places in, in places you would never expect it to be. So it, it takes some exploration and you, and you have to look around a bit. Now the lower part of the prairie is, is normally that area between the, the village of Gleason all the way down to Merrill. And you will notice on, on the map that's up in front of you right now that uh, that there are all sorts of different access points that you can get into the river. Uh, the river is mostly characterized as being wider and a little bit slower in velocity, uh, but that doesn't always hold true all the way through it. You can find, and I know Patrick is one who fishes the lower section quite a bit, uh, is that the, the lower section of the river also possesses some, some pretty rapid water and, uh, and some narrow sections and some brushier sections too. So it's a generalization, but it doesn't hold all the way through. Um, you, as you can tell uh, from our, a picture of our illustrious uh, chapter president here trying to figure out now what am I gonna put on? Um, this is a stretch uh, of the water in the lower section. And uh, it, because of its diversity, you can find all kinds of multiple facets in a single stretch in the lower river. Uh, you can have uh, a lot of islands and things which, which on one side of the island can be a, a fairly fast run. The other side can be a pool, can be a riffle. Um, the watershed, really, the Prairie River watershed begins in Northwest Langlade County. And uh, it begins up in a, in a place called Horseshoe Lake, which is right, let me see here. Try and do a couple of things. Okay, here we go. Um, Horseshoe Lake is, is, um, is in, if you notice right here, the darker color is all county forest land. Uh, the green, the darker green color area around the Minto Lake area is a uh, state land as well. This lake is located, if any of you know where Enterprise Lake is or Pelican is probably the most well known, uh, would be up, would be way up in here up to the, you know, north and east of, of the beginnings of the Prairie River. Um, the Prairie River begins out of Horseshoe, goes through Pine, comes through Minto and then proceeds uh, and makes its way over 
uh, across a, a lot of county forest land. Langley County Forest Land uh, holds most of the upper prairie. Um, and it's, uh, it's accessible because of that, because it's public land. Uh, there aren't a lot of easy ways to get into it um, other than using, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's quite a few ATV trails and things in there that, that on occasion will cross the river. Uh, but you have to do a fair amount of bushwhacking if you're going to get into the upper prairie. Uh, and of course, uh, as all of my neighbors up here say, there are no fish in it. Make sure that you tell people that. Uh, but there are fish. And it, and it is, uh, you will also notice um, that, that the upper prairie is fed with uh, a, a pretty good infusion of a lot of different um, a lot of different small small feeder streams, both named and unnamed. A lot of things that uh, feed into it. And, and having done a little bit of uh, travel up in some of this, there are there are a lot of uh, a lot of springs in this area. So it's a pretty good water source, and it's fairly well protected uh, because of the of the public land that is that is owned there. Uh, you'll see the white areas are privately owned, either by lumber companies or by um, by individuals, but most of the land uh, that the upper prairie is in and the headwaters is protected. Now, it, it, it flows through um, and then comes to a little burg, a small cluster of houses and trailers that also has their own sign in it, and that's right in here. And that is a sign that proclaims that you are now entering beautiful downtown parish. Um, and you will also notice that just outside of the, of the Burg of Parish, which is basically a couple of trailers, a house or two, and some, and some cabins that are on, on the river, um, there, outside of there is, is a small parking uh, lot. And that is the start of what is the DNR uh, Prairie Rivers Fisheries Area. And we'll go to that next. Now the Prairie River Fisheries Area, again, starts up in where that parking lot starts up in Parish, and um, it's just outside to the east of Parish. Um, there's a there's a parking lot here. There also is one right here on Highway H uh, that comes down. This is DNR Fisheries land as well. I th our chapter did some brushing up in there. I think Patrick was in on that one as well. Uh, we did some brushing up in this. Haven't been able to get back to it because of some of the water issues as far as high water when we schedule things. Uh, but that's part of the Prairie River Fisheries area as well. You can't see it very well, but uh, River Drive comes along here and there are en entrance points right here and here where you can get, you can get into the river and uh, there again, there's no fish in there. Um, if you come uh, it, you will note that most of most of the uh, the access to the river flows right along Highway 17, and it falls right down um, right down Highway 17. There is access to this this area. Um, you can access by coming in. Ooh, coo -coo. I'm not sure exactly, on, on Hanson Road is, is the place. This is not a weightable section for those of you that say, I wanna try that, I'm gonna hop in. Um, it tends to be fairly deep and fairly wide. And you know, it's one of the, it's kind of one of the, uh, the, the points of reference that I made that it's not always close in and, and choked off. Uh, this is a fairly wide open stretch in fairly deep water and it's very difficult to wade, although you can go around the edges on it a little bit. Um, Hanson Road is one place. If you notice, another good place to come in is the bridge at Han at R and H Road. Um, there is uh, uh, there is state land that comes all the way down to uh, what is now called New Earth Road. Um, so this is all state land within here. Yeah, that that is a stuff um, that is sometimes referred to as uh, the school forest and the um, you know the old Boy Scout camp. You know, there's you know, Patrick and I even had the discussion here the other day. We had to ask an ex expert for sure. You know, what is the uh, old school forest and and the uh, Boy Scout camp area, and, and it is in this area. 
there, this is this is R and H Road. If you notice up here, there's quite a bit of uh, rec uh, restoration work has been done right up in here. So you can hop in the river here and and hike it up if you want to. Um, right here is this road is called Hackbarts Road, and it's another parking area, and also again New Earth. New Earth is the place where one of our, our Eagle Scout projects has a waiter wash station we place there every year. Um, the next place of access really on the river, and you can see that there's work being done and there's work being done right now on that. And you'll see some of it later. Um, is This is Gross Road uh, right across from Echo Lake. And you, there's, a, there's a bridge in there. The, the DNR land is on the east side of the river. Uh, below that, um, it will, will takes us to Dudley, uh, one of the old logging cities uh, that no longer exists. And there is a there's Bridge Road that comes in here, and then what is uh, Dudley Road and C, or what is what what the sign says is Triple C, uh, right on Highway 17. And that that's the uh, the upper part of the DNR Fisheries land. Um, the next, the next part is the lower part where we pick up here, we pick up here right at right at Dudley Road. So we'll uh, we'll expand that one for you a little bit. Um, so we started. That's where we left off. So there's uh, again, there are there are places along the river where you can hop in at different places, different parking lots all the way down. Um, the city of Gleason is right in this area, right here. Um, Highway X uh, is uh, is right. This corner is one of the favorite places for anybody heading north. And I'll put a plug in the Prairie Pines uh, store right there is a Mennonite store. Um, <laughs> if you're going through there, the uh, by the way, the ice cream machine is now on. It's ready for the for the fishing season, so that's available there. Um, you will, we will note that uh, the Prairie River Fisheries area, there's more coming out here, Town Line Road, you can get in. Um, also off of P, um, there's Axon Road that comes here and then the North Branch of the Prairie comes up and you can also, this whole, whole Alta Springs fishing area is part of the watershed and there, there's public land there. You have quite a bit of public land and, uh, and access to the river. Um, this is a, this is courtesy of the Friends of the Prairie. Patrick gave me this map and this shows us uh, we can take a look a little bit closer when, it, when we're looking uh, at the, at the southern part. Uh, coming out of Gleason, uh, there, there's the, uh, there's Bloomville and with Highway J that comes across. There's Heinemann Road, which is another bridge access. Um, on Bloomville on J, there's uh, there is a state land and a parking lot right here as well. And then Patrick really knows the bottom section very well down here. You have uh, Hay Meadow Creek County Park. You've got the Prairie Dells Road coming in with the Dells, uh, Yankee Rapids. Uh, this is, um, oh God, this is Shady Lane going back. And this is the Prairie Road that goes back. In fact, there's access to the river all the way down into Merrill. Okay. Have we got any questions yet or nobody started yelling at me? That's good. Okay. Yeah, question? Yeah. Yeah, Shady Lane has changed its name, right? Yes, it is now. It's named after some guy that lives down there. It is, in fact, it, it was in the news. It was in the news, what was that? Holdorf. Yeah, Holdorf. Holdorf? It was, yeah. It was in the news here the other day because a woman from Weston, I was on an ATV and, and ran off and, and ended up uh, becoming deceased right, because she ended up in the river and uh, and drowned there on I think weekend. She ended up. What's that? I think she ended up in the, the silt pit. I think she did end up in the silt pit, yep. Yeah. And we'll talk about that in a minute, the silt pits. 
Okay, like most of our northern waters, the Prairie River watershed faced primarily two out of the two out of the three historic threats to its health. The three are logging of obstructions like dams and agricultural damage due to chemicals uh, and, and silt runoff into the streams. Uh, the Prairie River watershed was adversely affected by two of the three. The agricultural thing never really posed a great, a great threat to it directly, um, but most of it had to do with logging and with dams. Logging, um, you remember I talked about that little burg, you know, beautiful downtown parish. Uh, this, these, uh, this parish is one of probably, uh, you know, eight, eight or more little burgs all the way down the, the Prairie River watershed uh, where sawmills were placed. Um, logging practices in, in the, and one during the cutting of the pinery um, were, uh, were pretty ad, you know adverse to the resources. You know they there were no real <laughs> there were no rules. You know it's kind of like you know the old Clint Eastwood movie. You know what rules in a knife fight? There's no rules in logging back in those the turn of the century days. And so basically everything was clear cut. Basically anything goes. And so because of that. Um, un, unbridled development would happen for short periods of time. They would take off as much as they possibly could. They would use, uh, you know, damming and ramming, which basically said, you know, we'll, we'll float our logs down the river by damming it off, filling the, filling the, the, uh, the mill pond behind it uh, as full as it can be, and then blowing the dam and shooting the logs down the stream, which basically ripped the streams apart widened them, flattened them out. This, this particular, these particular pictures over here are from that little burg of Parish today. Like I said, Parish today is a couple trailers, a couple cabins, and a couple houses. Um, in its day, there were over 75 homes, uh, and they had three very distinct ethnic sections. There were the, there were the, there were the Irish and, and the, and the, uh, and the French, and I think there were the Kentucks, and they and they had different sections of the town. They had taverns. There was a full big hotel. There were stores and a school. This particular lumber mill in the turn of the century uh, was cranking out uh, ninety-five thousand board feet of white pine lumber uh, a day, and the and the shingle mill that was part of it uh, also cranked out over 100,000 shingles a day. And it ran seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year until the pine ran out. And then it all kind of went to pot, burned down, tore down, moved to the next place. And, and, and what was left was left in its wake. Um, to take another look here, this part, you know, for those of you that are, have been around Wausau, you know that this, you've probably seen this uh, timber uh, that commemorates the Wausau pioneer lumber industry. Well, guess what? That didn't come out of Wausau. That came out of Dudley, which is the, one of that little, little uh, uh, spot in the road just above Triple C on Highway 17. Um, and, it, and it doesn't really give you a good, a good perspective of how big that is. Um, you, a, a, a full grown person standing next to it would never, would not even begin to come to the top of that thing. If you look here on your right, this, this particular picture is the lumber mill off of Heinemann Road. Heinemann was a little, you know, you know, there's nothing that exists of Heinemann anymore, but at one time it was a booming sawmill town uh, that had all sorts of stuff in it. In fact, uh, this this particular picture would be south and uh, south and e and west of the bridge crossing the Prairie River on Heinemann Road. The property is now owned by Doc Jones, uh, and if you fish that area, you will go through. You the remnants of the Mill Pond Dam are still there, uh, so you can see it. But then also some of the damage is still there that was done. This area was just north of Gleason. Uh, it was an area that it gives you kind of an idea of what was left after the timber was taken off um, the, the land. And, and there's an interesting thing, and I didn't put it in here. 
Uh, but if you, you can go online, and I think it's called Aerial Wisconsin, you know, 1937. And if you look that up, if you Google it, uh, there, for whatever reason, in 1937, the state of Wisconsin uh, did a, a flyover of the entire state and took pictures of the entire state. So you can go in there and click on uh, the spots. And I've done that for some of these areas. And it's, it's just amazing to take a look at. The areas that even today are, are fully wooded are open, bare, uh, you know, sort of farmland that never took off. And so you can, you can see what happens after, after the logging ends. And the picture here is uh, on the right, lower right is, the, uh, is, is a log jam on the Wisconsin River just, just, just above Merrill. Um, and you can tell by the dress, you know, you're looking at probably 1920s, you know, in that. The other, along with sawmills, uh, logging also demanded damming the river for log control. Uh, two major dams built about the same time uh, in the late 1800s um, were built and, and, uh, and blocked the, the Prairie River watershed. Um, the first one is the Prairie Dells Dam, which is pictured here. Uh, that again, that dam was built in the 1800s. It created a two mile long mill pond that, that was behind, um, behind the dam. After logging was done, after the pinery was logged off, um, a lot of people had built, uh, you know, built homes and uh, vacation places along the lake and, and, and used the mill pond and the fishing was not too bad in that place. Um, but they decided back in 1905 uh, that in, since the pinery was pretty much shot and they didn't need it anymore, if you notice on this picture up on the left, this is a very early picture with the log chute where they would sort the logs and then sh uh, slip them down through the, uh, off the dam. They decided that they would build both, both the one here and the one in Merrill uh, were going to be turned into producing electricity. Well, um, what happened was uh, after the Lincoln County, uh, there, there came to be a problem. The engineer in charge of the project of putting the electrical generators in uh, mistake, made a mistake with a decimal point. And uh, they followed the design and evidently was never, never worked out to sufficiently generate electricity to pay for its operation. So it never never generated commercially any electric power out of this dam. Lincoln County over the years spent thousands and thousands of dollars to repair and to keep it, but in the end, it just became too costly. Uh, a fellow by the name of Bob Martini of the D DNR was given the uh, <laughs> unenviable job of uh, being part of the leadership that was, to ch it was in charge of the removal of the dam. You know, that upset uh, landowners tremendously, knowing that their lakefront property was about to be gone, um, but it was removed in 1991. Uh, the Dad, DNR, we have, we, we have a question that? from Linda. Okay. Yes, Linda. are there any remains of the old sawmills? Are there any remains of the old sawmills? Um, there are like skeleton. The ones the ones I've seen are like skeletons. On Bob, uh, like the one I was talking about on Heinemann, you can go there and it's like almost like an archaeological site. You can see uh, the the stone uh, foundations and cement foundations for a lot of the the sawmill buildings and the and the lumber yards and things like that. And there are there are some of those still in existence. The ones up, there was a, there was a big dam at the one up in Parrish as well. Uh, there are, you can see some of the abutments and things, but they're really, most of the time when, when the, uh, from what I read, most of the time when the, when the, uh, when the, when the supply of lump pine, pine stopped, they would take, they, they would basically 
demolish, strip everything out and pack it up and move it downstream to the next spot or, or upstream to where the pine was so that they could continue on. So it's not, a, it's not unusual that uh, the equipment and all of the stuff from a sawmill would be taken out of, uh, out of a, out of a non-producing sawmill, um, put it on rail cars or, or hauled out in any way they can and taking it to a new more productive place and used it. Like Alexander, um, the Stuart Alexander uh, sawmills and things, the, the big lumber barons, they were always moving their stuff around uh, to where it was yeah. productive. Yeah. John, uh, this is Henry here. Uh, Hi, Henry. Yeah, for Linda, uh, and I'm sure you know where these places are, John, but uh, up in your area, if you go to some places in that upper uh, prairie region around Parrish, you can find logs that are still in the river that are just hu huge and on, on the banks of the river. You know, mm -hmm. there, there are logs left over uh, who never made it down to that sawmill that are in, yep. in the water still and preserved. So, yeah. Well, and you know, you'll the find those all up and down there. The, yeah. You'll find those all up and down the river and even on the Wisconsin River. Uh, we would, I know I ended up replacing a prop on my, on my Aluma craft one day after I found one. Um, and uh, <laughs> after I looked at it and it popped up, I saw it didn't even have a, have a branding mark on the end of it for the, you know, the, where they slap in the name of the, of the sawmill or the, of the outfit that owned it. So, yep, they're around. They are around. So that's the, that's the Prairie Dells Dam. Now today, it's a, it's a much different place. It is now, uh, because of the work that, that was done by the Department of Natural Resources and others, uh, it is a beautiful free flowing stream. Um, and the fishing has changed, obviously, you know, both above the, the old dam and below the dam. Um, it has changed, it is different. And, and there are neighbors up there that are still quite unhappy that they don't have lakefront property. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard, to, uh, hard to fight what it looks like now. In fact, the, if, if for those of you that come to that area, there's a very sharp drop off right there at the Prairie Dells and they put observation, they have trails and observation places where you can safely look over the edge without, uh, without becoming part of the river inadvertently. Um, the next dam that we have to talk about is the Ward Paper Dam in Merrill. Uh, that was put in about the, and originally, the original dam was put in about the same time as the Prairie Dells Dam. Um, and it, and it was, again, was part of uh, the lumber industry at that time. It was, uh, it, it had an 118 acre mill pond uh, up from the dam. But this time, since it was in an urban environment, uh, Merrill grew up, it, unlike Heinemann that uh, were, uh, were or where the dam was in on the Prairie Pine, the uh, Prairie Bluffs area. Yeah, it this is this this city grew up. So Merrill grew up around this thing, and it had this 180 acre mill pond, um, and people built houses all along that uh, mill pond, uh, and put their docks in, and they would they would fish, they would water ski, they would do all sorts of things. It was a it was an urban lake. Well, Ward Paper left Merrill and, and the dam in, in the 1990s. And, uh, and with it, they left a problem because it was unmaintained for many years. In fact, uh, it had in it the original wooden dam gates that were installed when they went to power in 1905. Um, the estimates to repair uh, the dam uh, or to replace it uh, were well in excess of a million dollars at that time, back in the, back in the mid nineties. Uh, the city, the county, the residents uh, tried all kinds of different ways, but none of them were able, or were able to come up with or willing to come up with the repair money. Uh, the DNR then was uh, put in charge of dealing with the, with the issue. And, uh, and of course, what one of the things that they are, they're looking for and is to open the river up so that it's free flowing as well. 
Um, and poor Bob Martini, who who fought the battle on the <laughs> up on the on the Prairie Dells Dam, was put in charge of the Ward Paper Mill Dam uh, removal. Um, after he faced nine failed lawsuits and some numerous death threats, uh, and later the dam was drawn down and the removal began in September of 1999. Now, if you look carefully at this sign here, this kind of sums up the sentiment of a lot of the landowners and folks in, city, in the city, and where they say, you are now leaving Mud Flat City. And on the bottom, it says, thank you to the DNR and FP, exclamation point. FP, Patrick, what would that be? Well, that's the Friends that's of the prairie. prairie. Friends of the Prairie, congratulations. You were, you were well loved. Um, the you know the black um, the black balloons and bunting and crepe paper were were placed on the bridges uh, the, the Prairie River Bridge going over the, where it meets the Wisconsin in downtown uh, Merrill and uh, and it was ugly for quite a while. In fact, to today uh, you, you don't want to necessarily bring up the wonderful things that have happened, but wonderful things have happened. Today, that area that, where the mill pond used to be is now the Prairie Trails Park. And it's a city owned park and it has been uh, established for recreation and reclamation of the land. And uh, in it, there are walking trails. There is, uh, there's, you can fish right in that river. Um, again, there's no trout in, in the river. No. There, I, actually, there, there is trout fishing all the way to the Wisconsin River um, and, uh, and observations and nature things. And they have picnic things. It, it's really become a wonderful thing. Uh, some of the neighbors are still not real happy that they look out over a park instead of a lake. Uh, but it's pretty hard to argue with a free flowing stream uh, all the way um, from Horseshoe Lake, 40 miles down to the to the Wisconsin River. Uh, may I say something? Yeah. Um, this is Terry Cummings. I inherited Hi, that from Bob Martini as the dam safety engineer. And yeah. one thing in state statutes is you cannot issue an abandonment permit unless all transfer options are exhausted. And right. uh, International Paper offered that dam to the city of Merrill for a dollar and Merrill rejected it behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And then in front of uh, the public, Mayor Kaler was of course saying that Bob Martini was pulling their grandchildren's toenails out. But <laughs> every, that was the most mind numbing project of my 14 years in dams. Yeah, uh, Terry, I can't imagine what that must have been like. That you know, was not, it was not a good time. Um, thank you. Huh? I said, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that, you know, for those, well, yeah, thank you for those that, that, that put their necks on the line and did this because it really is, it is a wonderful. You know, we now have pretty much the entire watershed is free flowing all the way from Horseshoe Lake right down into the into uh, the Wisconsin River. Um, there are a couple little dams uh, in different places on some of the feeder streams, uh, which I'm sure would be nice to have gone, but some of those fights are not not are not worth the effort, I guess, right now. So, okay. It shows you know, things like this with the with the uh, Prairie Dells area and the in in the tra Prairie Trails Park shows us what restoration of a river from human damage can accomplish. Um, resorting and fixing the damage that uh, unbridled commerce can do is not something new. You know, Wisconsin Con the Wisconsin Conservation Department, the predecessor of the of the current DNR, which came into existence in I think 1967 merged with the resources board. They did a lot of stream work in the 50s and the, in the 60s in the Prairie River watershed. In fact, you will, if you fish the river, you will find those places where there are wing dams 
and other, uh, other signs of work that was done back in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, back in those days, uh, what, what normally happened, they would narrow the stream beds with wing dams and habit, and habitat techniques like half logs, brushing, and boom covers. They, a lot of stuff has changed uh, since then with time and watching what works and what doesn't work, but the desired outcome is the same, is to restore and protect cold water resources. This is a picture of, um, of what, what the current project is going on up in up off of Degas Road. This is part one of uh, a project that will continue again this year. And, and this is the place where our chapter is gonna be uh, planting about a thousand trees on the point bars and the islands uh, uh, under the direction of the DNR fisheries folks. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of work can be done and a lot, of, a lot of things can be done to preserve and to save the resources that we have. Now getting back to that whole business of the trout fishing capital of the world, um, if, 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 if it is so, then we need something to celebrate our status in the, in the world of angling. And guess what, we do. Uh, we have, uh, as recorded, the Wisconsin state record brook trout, brook trout, nine pounds, 15 ounces, was caught on September 2nd, 1944 in the Prairie River in Langlade County, and it was caught by John Mixus. Now, what you're seeing in front of you is a, is a replica, which is on display in Fisher's Bar, which is the former, for those of you old timers, was the farmer, former Hope and Marv's Bar, which is at the, com, you know, at the, at the junction of Highway 17 and Q, north of Parrish in, in Gleason. And I had, uh, and, and I think that I think if you want to really be serious about all this stuff, you should do some research and go to Fisher's Bar, hoist, hoist a beer and look at the replica. Um, I had the privilege to talk to John Mixus Jr. Uh, John Mixus, who caught the fish, who died, you know, you know, quite a few years ago. And so I sat down with John and I, and I asked him uh, what he knew about this uh, state record brook trout. Um, and he told me that, he told me what he knew. Um, in fact, he said, I, I can't verify it for fact because I, I wasn't born yet. And he, he, he says he likes to say, I was born and he was five, uh, nine months after his dad caught the trout. <laughs> so he must have went home and celebrated after that one or something. Um, anyway, I'm uh, talking to John Jr. and he said that his father uh, was uh, a farmer and a pipe fitter and had numerous different jobs. Um, but he spent most of his available time on around out in the woods and in the water. Um, nothing fancy, but he, he, was, he was one of these guys who was always out and knew what was going on. He said, according to his dad, that he, his dad had spotted this fish about a week or so before he caught it. And he devoted every day out there trying to figure out how to catch this fish. Now, most of us as trout fishermen of, you know, of, a, of high class, we would think that, that wouldn't it be nice to know that the state record brook trout was caught on a, on a fine cane rod with a, with a, with a 12 foot, you know, six X tippet, you know. Um, actually, uh, John Jr. told me what his dad used. He used a large, a very large minnow uh, and it was attached to his father's uh, short and stubby and very stout musky rod with uh, probably had braided line and a treble hook on it. And he was able to feed the, feed the, uh, feed the large minnow multiple times down into the pool until, until the fish was caught. And, and he hauled the fish, he said, from, from, the, from the place which was called the pool uh, north of parish, which doesn't exist anymore, um, hauled it to the parish store and, and post office that was in existence in 1944. Um, got the, got the, the store owner and the postmaster out of bed and he went there because that was the only certified scale between Rhinelander and Merrill. And so he went in and, they, and he, uh, the postmaster witnessed and, and measured it uh, and, or weighed it, I should say. And uh, he, 
his dad made contact with uh, the state and they accepted it as the state record brook trout. Well, um, that, that, is, that is the state record brook trout caught, caught in Langley County. Now, as you all imagine, uh, if any of you have spent any time um, in a, in a sitting on a bar stool anywhere, the first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to doubt that it happened, right? And, and there may be very good reasons to be doubting it. So there was a fellow back in 1995 by the name of Bob Fillman of Fond du Lac, and maybe, maybe he's around and you know him, but uh, he contacted the Wisconsin Outdoor Journal and the editor of the Wisconsin Outdoor Journal contacted Earl and Joan Little, who uh, fished the prairie often and also wrote for the journal uh, to investigate this. And for five months, uh, they went and they tried to track down as much information as possible, interviewing everyone they thought could help validate or dispute the catch. Uh, they talked to bar owners, fishery experts, field and they caught the, uh, the field and stream magazine because they had awarded uh, John uh, the, like fish of the year, the brook trout fish of the year for Wisconsin. They used to give out medals. Um, they talked to the Tavern Society in, in Chicago because uh, there was a rumor uh, to the effect that the, that the fish was given to somebody who took it to Chicago, had it mounted and put on a bar wall. Um, the historical societies, newspapers, and John's, and they talked to John's wife who was still living at the time and, two, and his two sons, both John and, and Randy. Um, and, they, and they came to, to this conclusion. And, uh, and I'd like to read it from the magazine. Um, it says here, uh, there were many phone calls, excitedly pursued false leads and disappointments, small and large. Uh, questions remain. Was the trout a native or a planted breeder that had served his time at a fish hatchery or somewhere else? Who verified the catch? Where is the fish? Did our state record hop the border? Is it still destroyed or swimming in somebody's attic? Anybody, does anybody know and will they talk? We have only scratched the surface of a much more complicated story. Will we ever learn? Joan and I would like to thank everybody, especially the Mixus family for their cooperation. And should you ever hear more, we'd like to hear from you. So is it a state record? Isn't it? Did it come from <laughs> out of a stock pond or whatever? Uh, the, the Mixus family obviously and, and, and very strongly says, nope, it, it, you know, dad caught that out of the, out of the prairie. Um, so until, until otherwise uh, known or discovered, uh, we, we in our chapter in the Prairie River hold the uh, record brook trout for the state of Wisconsin. Okay. That's all I have. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna turn this one over to uh, Kirk at this time, and he's gonna to talk to you about some signs. Give me a second here. All right. So as, as John alluded to earlier, you're driving on north on 17, or if you, and many years ago, if you were driving South on 17, just before you got into Gleason in both cases, there were two signs proclaiming Gleason area, trout capital of the world. And uh, John, just like myself, myself having been born in Montana and gone back there every summer until I was about 18 or 19, uh, kind of looked at those signs and laughed, <laughs> you know, and said, yeah, whatever. Um, and as he indicated, I'm sure people in New Zealand or Montana and Colorado and other places like that would, in, in the southwest part of the state, would, would, would like to argue this. But I will say <clears throat> that these signs were the idea and the creation of three teachers in the area that were uh, um, fifth grade teachers, uh, some of those who were art teachers, and uh, they did a fantastic job on these two signs. They, they did, uh, this was a big community project involved Midway School, which is uh, 
still kind of there in, in, in that area. At least the building is. I don't know if the school exists anymore. But uh, we figure about 2003 or 2004, the, they were thought up by the three teachers. The project was funded by the Gleason Community Club. Um, so, and, and if you'll notice the signs now, the one sign that does exist, that does need some work on it. And we're gonna pursue that as a project to get some people that are artistic enough to be able to do the right work to, to revive it. Um, the other sign that was, as you were heading south, was taken down by the DOT because it was put up on state land without permission. Uh, the sign was destroyed, but the unique thing about that sign was that it was a brown trout, and you can't really see it in this picture, but all of the fifth grade students in the rings on the brown trout signed their names. So they all had their names up there in writing. It's too bad that sign got taken down, but it did. So, and you can, you can see there's a number of adult volunteers and things like that. There were countless hours put into these things. Um, and it, it was a, a great sense of community pride and, and you know, kind of doing something for the area to, to make their own recognition, which uh, we won't argue about it being the trout, trout fishing capital of the world or anything like that. We'll just acknowledge that a lot of times for all of us, wherever you go fish, you know, on a trout stream, if that's your usual spot, it is your trout fishing capital of the world. So this is the sign, like I said, that still exists. And it says Gleese and R, <laughs> you know, trout fishing capital of the world. It does need some work, but this is on private land. That's why it's still there. And uh, we're going to try to do some, get some work done on it with the approval from the people that put the sign up first and stuff. So um, it's just a great thing. I, I, I didn't see any of the teachers join, but it would have been nice to hear from them. I did send them the meeting invite, but uh, um, so, but they're on Zoom classes and stuff all day. So maybe this is too much. So anyway, so if you wanna know, that's how we did the story. And uh, you know, it's a story, we're gonna stick to it. And we're very proud to have them there. So Patrick, this is where before Patrick starts, Patrick, you have to make sure that you mention your website with the hatch chart on it. He's put a tremendous amount of time into this. It's a great thing, especially if you want to fish this river you really need to take notice of it. Well, thanks, nicely done. Good evening. Uh, this is a Friends of the Prairie River flashback, then it's not gonna take long. Uh, in the summer of 1997, Doug Azes and myself were driving back from a day on the Prairie River and the conversation uh, went to why isn't there anything being done on the Prairie River since the, t the dam removal of the Prairie Dells. So we thought that maybe the Prairie River could need some love and uh, we'll try to put together a group of people who care. <clears throat> In January, 1998, um, we decided to have a meeting at the Gander Lodge at the Gander Mountain Store. Uh, we put an ad in the paper, thank you, Jim Lee. And uh, we, we also sent out a mailer on uh, the Gander Mountain the mailing list. And uh, we were going to discuss uh, the, the Prairie River, the future of the Prairie River. Well, <clears throat> over 60 people showed up. And uh, it was quite lively and passionate. Uh, the DNR was there to discuss uh, their opinions of what should be done with the Prairie River. And a lot of folks uh, suggested what they thought should be done with the Prairie. Uh, 
after the meeting, Jim Lee wrote another article, a follow-up article in a piece of the Wassa Daily Herald. And uh, may I say that uh, Herb Hintz and uh, Wisconsin Valley Trout Limited were not happy. Uh, in February, 1998, the steering committee uh, was sort of was formed. Doug Aziz, Joe Krasnowrich, Pete Segerson, Al Hauber, Russ Akey, Jay Millenbaugh, and several others. And we decided that we were going to send out a mailing to all of the landowners on the Prairie River. So we compiled this list uh, using plat books and what have you. And we sent them all out for a meeting at Lesson Gyms in April of uh, that year. The DNR was present. Um, Doc Jones gave a talk about the WIP funding, and the WIP funding was a uh, wildlife habitat improvement project. And you could access up to $10,000, if I remember correctly, for uh, stream improvement. And people, Sigerson talked about the actual stream improvement uh, mechanics and how it would proceed. Uh, in the spring of 1998, uh, we went out and visited several sportsman clubs throughout the area. May I say that the Lincoln County Sportsman Club was uh, not fun. Uh, that was a tough one. Um, they had no passions whatsoever for any regulations and any changes to uh, trout fishing on the prairie. It was an experience. Um, let's see, we put up signs at all the access points. And I don't know if you could see this or not. Yay, nay. Nay. Is anybody out there hearing me? You're good, Patrick. The sign, if you'd hold it up in front of your face, you'd probably be able to see it. Okay, how about that? Yeah, I can hear you, Patrick. Okay, good. Uh, we put those signs up up and down the river at all the access points. I still have six or seven signs left if anyone would like to put one up at their particular favorite spots. Um, we had an annual spring cleanup at the access points up and down the river, uh, at the adopt a highway stretch and uh, highway Dudley North, then followed by a grill out at the Hay Meadow Creek Park. And we had a great time when the weather cooperated. We had some awful, awful times that it did not. Uh, okay, uh, starting point in 1998, Doc Jones uh, had uh, his property uh, from Jay downstream to Prairie River Road. Uh, it was a great uh, improvement. Uh, Pete Sigerson did it in his backhoe. Uh, but after that followed 1999 uh, Axon Road by Jay Whiting. In 2000, we did a stream improvement project upstream upstream from Jay. 2001, Doc Raven and Bob Smenick uh, at Deer Trail Road, Jameson's Plantation Road, John Scar, 600 feet on the Prairie Forks Road, Lawrence Street Improvement Projects. 2002, uh, post-war dam pickup. 2006, Adamac. 2007, 2008, the Heinrich Brothers. Jay Millenbaugh um, collected for Trout Unlimited uh, 15 easements from folks like the Dean Boyd and Daniel Patricia Vandergeest, Gary Schwartz, uh, Paul Doris Lang, et cetera, et cetera. I won't name them all. From RH Road to Hackbart was a class five stream when we started the, the Friends of the Prairie River. We got the DNR to extend it to Dudley for a five year uh, experiment. 
2007, the question was put out on the spring uh, conservation hearings without any data that read from, that said, excuse me, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I got it on a point here. That said, do you favor changing the regulations on the Prairie River from RNH Road to downstream 17, Highway 17 from Cater 45? And it was a resounding no. Okay. And we were just flabbergasted. Well, in 2008, it was put up again. And the DNR apologized because they said that the last year's question to change five miles of the Prairie River cattle for Corey five to category four was presented for a vote with no data. So this time, this year, they introduced the data. And it said that there was, in that five year period, the Brook trout increased by 110% below 10 inches, but increased by 200% over 12 inches. That went on to win by almost a 70% approval uh, vote throughout the state at the the spring hearings. It went forward to the Cold Water Resource Board and they voted on it and they said without local considerations they will not support it and we lost even though we won. And may I say that that was the end of the Friends of the Prairie River. Uh, there was hardly any more meetings after that. And in fact, I think the last uh, scheduled event on the, their website was a spring, spring cleanup in 2010 and no one showed up and nothing has been done since. But we hate, we fought a great battle. That's it, I'm done. Okay, I wanna, uh, wanna explain, in my opinion, uh, there was a, a failure on Wisconsin River Valley Trout Unlimited time to use this as a resource and join in with them and do these things. And I don't, I don't know all the reasons why, but it's just what happened. We look at it as if the group started up again, they would be now a great asset to us and we could be a great asset for them. Um, they are gonna have this cleanup day on the 24th, right, Patrick? That's correct. <clears throat> I encourage any of you that have time to get out there and help them. They're a great group of people. And uh, we will look forward to them maybe getting back together in the future and getting together with us. Those of us who are left. <laughs> <laughs> well understood, but still, there's people out there that care. That's all it means. <clears throat> you gonna talk about your chart now? Oh, I guess. You uh, if you've gone on the Wisconsin fly fishing page and if you read the the intro to this, uh, this started way back when uh, my wife and I owned the Orvis Fly Fishing Shop in Milwaukee. And uh, with the local TU chapters and our fishing uh, customers, they would bring in all this information. We started to compile this emergence calendar. Now there were other emergence calendars out there at the time, yes. Um, but over the years, it's gone from, you know, uh, one form to another uh, is now online and uh, 
I, I, it was a whole lot of work and I'm really actually quite proud of it. Uh, I think it's uh, very, very accurate. And uh, I think that anyone who fishes uh, not only the Prairie River, but I mean, statewide, I mean, there is Kinnikinnik olives and Brule River flies that are no play ourselves. Uh, Wolf River sulfurs that only appear on Father's Day uh, is quite extensive and is uh, quite complete. Uh, I think that anyone who <clears throat> is interested in uh, fly fishing would appreciate this. But again, you don't have to know Latin to be a good fisherman. It's just a guide. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the Pass Lake. That's it. That's all I have. I'm just going to add a little bit more to this. Patrick has spent, I don't know how many years putting this together. And when you look at it, it looks simple, but it's pretty complex. And by looking simple, anybody can use it to their advantage. I would tell you to do that. It'll help you out. And I think we all owe Patrick a big thank you for doing this. So um, you see he's got his work day up there and our tree planting's up there. So um, what we're left with now at the end is anybody who remembers what John put up there at the front, which is pick three flies that you would use all season on the Prairie River. Anybody who's dangerous enough to admit what their opinion is, hold on and, and chime in. So that's where we're going. Good luck. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the screen and you can un, you can unmute everybody and turn your turn your videos on and yep. away we go. So and, and you could ask any other questions too. Okay, just post a link <clears throat> to the hash chart. Yeah, we could do that. I have a, uh, an answer to your questions. Uh, the three flies that I would <laughs> use on the Prairie River is uh, Ed Haga or Cap Bettner's hair winging Adams, um, Green Peter wet fly, or a number two red quill. <clears throat> okay. Patrick, what's the fly you gave to me that one day when you and I were fishing? It was kind of, uh, it almost looked like an Adams, but it had a, a brown spiral on that's the body. A, uh, that's a hair wing. Uh, hair wing. Yeah. Is that what it was? Okay. Some people call the Cap Fetner's hair wing Adams, but Ed Hager tied them. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> I do a pass lake trude because uh, you can fish it wet or dry, and, and you know, and uh, it it works very well up here. And I would probably have to have a parachute Adams in there somewhere, probably about a fourteen. And uh, hmm, I, I I would go. I, I shouldn't give this away, but I, I'd use a renegade. <laughs> Henry, which is really, what do you use? Which is really a Western fly, but you know the dumb thing works. You, did you talking to me? Yeah, I said Henry. What would you use? Oh, yeah, I. You know, I think I would use an an, an Adams, in a fourteen. Uh, <clears throat> later in the season, I think I would go to a, <clears throat> a white fly tied parachute for the for the white fly hatch. And I think I, I kind of agree with Linda that if I were going to go underwater, that I would use a uh, a black woolly bugger because I have uh, waded in the prairie and there are a lot of black leeches. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I have been uh, fishing in the prairie when there have been some uh, monk kids fishing uh, in there. And when they get out of the water, th there were actually leeches on their legs because they, they didn't have any um, uh, waders. So they were just fishing barely. And so they, they, they actually had leeches attached to them. So 
I know that there's a lot of leeches in that in that prairie. So I think those are the th those are the three that that I would use. Hey George, are you here? I don't think I see him. I don't Patrick. think he joined, Patrick. Well, what about <clears throat> uh, Bob <clears throat> Swoboda? Are you here? I don't think so either. I'll take I'll a crack at it. First, I don't know why I'm an administrator. I must have done something <laughs> wrong again. But, uh, <laughs> That's how you named yourself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, Serves me right for touching it. Um, my on a on a dry. I've been using it for about three four years now, all over the place. Um, I love a Mercer's Missing Link. Uh, it is the most revolutionary um, suggestive dry I've ever tried. A nymph is a weighted stonefly <laughs> nymph in the heavy water. And a wet would be a partridge in, in orange. Hmm. Oh. Who else is out there? Linda, I'll give you my stab. My stab would be, um, I love the parachute atoms, probably uh, maybe even as big as a size 12. Um, I definitely would do some type of brown drake emerger. Um, I'm trying to tie some of my own this, this spring, kind of my own doing. Uh, and then I still think that in our streams around here, a black caddis, either body, definitely with the body, uh, works just generally about any time. Um, but Unfortunately, there's about five other things I can think of. Those are just the first three that I really remember catching some nice fish on in that river. Hey, Carmen, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> sure, it won't be very technical. A uh, parachute atoms, woolly bugger, and a soft tackle. Sweet. It's simple. And the, the soft tackle, yeah, the soft tackle, uh, fish downstream. Hmm. Joe's probably rolling right now because he's the one who showed me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Patrick, uh, question for you. Sure. Hi, Henry. Yeah. Do you do you ever get into masking hatches on the prairie where you have, like in the early season, you'll have the um, the Hendrickson, the East Liberia, and then you'll also have the the smaller version, the Inveria, uh, hatch at the same time, and you'll see the larger subvaria. So you use a larger fly, but the trout will actually be taking the smaller ones. You ever come into that situation? Uh, I, I I I've found that happening uh, on, on the prairie sometimes when when both of those uh, Hendrickson's are hatching at the same time, you'll see the big ones, but they're really taking the little ones. Yeah, I think you're correct, but I, it's been so long. I haven't seen a decent hatch of either in the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. I, I, in fact, all of the hatches on the prairie seem to be so diminished. Yeah. Uh, the brown drakes, the sulfurs, mm -hmm. the paralepsis. Uh, I don't. I don't know why it's the numbers have dis, diminished so much. But when I can remember back then, yes. <laughs> have you seen a decline in the in the number of? of you know, I I don't fish that lower section of the prairie much. I I do fish the upper section. And most of the time, I, I fish that uh, with 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 an Adams, and uh, and I, I rarely nymph. I just I just I just fish it with a dry fly to the edges. Um, 
you know, and the, I, I did fish it one winter uh, down from Heinemann Road and, uh, you know, by uh, Doc Jones property. And I went in there and I think it was, I think it was January and it must have been a mild January because otherwise I, I wouldn't I wouldn't get in the water. But there were some winter winter black stones coming off, and the fish were actually feeding on the surface. And so what I did was um, I, I I got a, a large uh, elk hair caddis and just got a black marker off, uh, you know, and and just colored it black, and uh, I was catching catching trout on dries in the middle of the winter. So, so that was, so yeah, that could, surprised me. A good pattern for that is, uh, for the early winter stones is a flying ant. Oh, okay. Yeah, that works really well. Yeah, with the wings, okay. Yeah, you don't need a black marker. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you're looking good. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, one of my, you know, I used to do these puzzles called what, um, what would you do? And uh, I, I gave some to John Meacham for our TU um, uh, um, monthly newsletter. And one of the first ones was when I just started to fish to fly fish and I was on the on the prairie in the summer and uh, you know I, I, I was just a beginning fly fisher and uh, I didn't I didn't know anything about the hatches uh, I didn't know much you know about fly fishing really <clears throat> and um, the uh, um, I was caught during that summer in the midst of one of these Wisconsin downpours I mean, it just came down buckets for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then just as suddenly as it's, it started, it stopped. <clears throat> and I got back in the river and I could see some rises on the far side of the, of the river, of the prairie. And I, I kind of, uh, went went over there and I could not figure out what they were taking and so I um, I, I put on a royal wolf you know went, went in doubt try a royal wolf so so I threw a royal wolf out there and ha having to hook uh, 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 you know a dumb trout and um, I discovered what he was taking was this black beetle that had washed off of a pine tree that was that was hanging over the stream. And the only place that these rises were were downstream from this from this pine tree. So I looked and looked and I had no black beetles. So I thought to myself, now what am I going to do? I have no black beetles. So I got out a black ant pattern and and I clipped off the front part of the ant. So it looked like, like a beetle with just the black, with the back portion of the ant on it. And I threw that up there and I started hooking fish. So that was, you know, that was like, wow. You know, I could, I just, I was so proud of myself because I, I had solved the puzzle. You know, I had a fly that, I wanted a fly that I didn't have and so I looked through my fly box and saw this, saw these ants and thought, well, I can cut the front section of the ant off and maybe it will look like a beetle. And, and, well, so, and so I kind of solved the, the, one of the first fly fishing puzzles that I ever had. So, you know, so I wrote that up as a, what would you do? Kind well, of a, good for you, that was fun. Yeah, it was. Hey, Doug, are you on? Doug is on. I'm on. Hey, how you doing? Good. What do you got? 
for flies. <laughs> and I've, only, I've only fished the Prairie River once. I fished it on June 26 of 2017. I threw a uh, Bob Hazy emo bugger and I got a brown almost 15 inches. Wow. And that's the only thing I got written down. Wow. What what color was the emu bugger? It's his standard emu bugger. It's got a, a gold bead, a pink collar, and then the gray, it's got a brown chenille body and okay, brown. gray, and the emu feathers are kind of gray. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Laura Wright, how you doing? Hey, what a there. there she is. Oh, your flies. <laughs> I'm uh, the other half of Laura Wright. I'm Tim Wright. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When I don't know anything, I just take out a parachute atoms or a hair's ear and flail the water until I'm too tired and go home. <laughs> Wait. Wait. <laughs> hey, Lynn. Yes, sir. How are yours? I would probably do uh, the Adams, and uh, I love nymph fishing, so I'd probably have to play around and uh, figure out what I wanted to do there. But uh, the fail safe would be uh, the Milwaukee Elite, only because uh, Henry Colts and Mike Coor have uh, talked it up so much. I've had some uh, luck with it down in the driftless, but haven't really fished it up in the northern streams that much. And I think if I wanted to really tough it out, if I wasn't doing anything, I'd probably uh, bring my spinner and have to throw uh, a Vibrix Blue Fox and about a three ace and black and gold to really uh, see if I was that bad of a fisherman or not. Oh, well, that's great. Where do you fish? Mm -hmm. I normally fish down here uh, in the central sands area. I, I live in Oshkosh, so I spend a lot of my time out on the, uh, the white, the west branch of the white, uh, the McCann, and down through there. And then uh, two or three times a year, I try and get down to the southwest. How's the McCann doing? Uh, I didn't get, I got out there <laughs> once last year for about a half hour, but McCann's been fishing well, according to Doug Erdman. He has to uh, text me and call me every time uh, he does well and makes me feel like uh, I do not know how to fish. So <laughs> when I had the fly fishing shop in Milwaukee, uh, the McCann was the place to go to for a day's fishing out of Milwaukee. So uh, I have a lot of memories there. Central Wisconsin has done a lot of work with the DNR, you know, both on the McCann and on uh, the west branch of the white. So, I mean, those are really two hot streams. Um, Tom Lager is probably gonna get pissed at me for telling everybody this, but. Uh, He's, and, uh, he on, oh, okay, then I'm safe. And, and on the safe. west branch, the west branch of the white, you get a chance to actually catch, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, natural producing rainbows along with brook or browns, if you can get up uh, far enough and, and have some fun with it, so. So you could fish for the cycle. Absolutely. And I've actually, I caught a one night uh, hex fishing on the white. I caught a 12 yeah. inch uh, rainbow. Wow. Kind sweet. Of about, uh, about a mile and a half up from uh, the uh, Duels Bridge. So about where the power lines cut across if anybody's fished that section. So Not recently. <laughs> Lynn? Yes. Yeah, Henry Kanemoto here. Um, did, did you say they're naturally reproducing rainbows in that, in that river? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I work a lot with Scott Bundy and, and Sean Sullivan and, and uh, Bundy always shows me uh, or sends me pictures when they do uh, the first of the year shocking to see what's, what's going on. Wow. And they've uh, shocked, uh, you know, uh, natural producing uh, rainbows out of there, so. Yeah, I thought there were no natural reproducing rainbows except for one stream that was in the Menominee Reservation. That's what, I, I either had read that or heard that 
from somebody in the DNR, but obviously that's not true. You know, I thought there were only naturally reproducing Browns and yep, no, uh, in in Wisconsin. Yep, this was above. Uh, and sorry, my internet is kind of unstable, but hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Um, this is above uh, Cottonville Road. There's a, a section that they just did a, a bunch of work on here about three years ago, putting in a silk trap and, and working on it. But you can go above uh, Cottonville, kind of uh, by the airport in Watoma. They, they seem to be not as prevalent as they used to be. And in the 80s, I could catch the uh, naturally reproducing rainbows in the Shapey and in uh, the West Branch and Bird and Bowers too. Um, and it's getting harder. And I did hook one in the main white once too. But uh, at the one of the youth camps, I got one of the kids a the uh, NR Rainbow Watts in the West Branch. So they're still in there. The owner, the, of, Fisher's, the owner of Fisher's Bar up here is, has, a, has a place right on queue and there's Payne Spring that comes in and a culvert that goes under queue. And uh, <laughs> his daughter caught a really nice rainbow trout right out of the culvert last summer. Uh, but but up above, that's one of the remaining dams uh, in the watershed. And up above it, the guy the guy stocks and, and raises trout in there. So the thing must have washed over in a rain event. So every once in a while, a, a rainbow gets loose on the prairie and, and is caught, believe it or not. Hmm. Uh, you, you guys that catch those rainbows, are they are they typically in that faster water? Or the the you know that like they're supposed to be in. And more the rapids, the real fast water rather than the slower water, or are they located basically anywhere? When we were catching uh, rainbows on the prairie, they basically were in Yankee Rapids. Right, that's where I always caught them, which is that fast water. Yes. I caught a bunch of them in the Prairie Dells area, sliding down the uh, what I call the cliffs there many years ago. There were some nice big rainbows in there. And I, I mean, it was weird fishing because it's so rocky in there that you get little six inch diameter pools behind rocks and you basically hide behind the rock and just drop a fly in there and yeah. something nails it. But I mean, sometimes that they were big enough to start running your line out too, so. And on the white, your best chance is right, uh, probably downstream from where uh, the West Branch comes in for a good chance to catch one of the rainbows there. That's about where I was, where the power lines cut across there, uh, across the white is just downstream, about a quarter mile downstream, eighth of a mile downstream from where uh, the uh, West Branch comes in, so. They like to hold in those pockets there. Hey, Patrick, I got a question for you. Go. No. Yeah, you know, on that deal on the Prairie River, uh, trying to expand that catch and release area, right? Right around, oh, that, uh, I think it was the school forest area. What was that the area that initially was? was the initial area was R and H Road down to Hackbarth. Oh, okay. You know, that, I, I'm wondering whether, you know, that, that timing was, was not right because, you know, the DNR is, is trying to get away from special regs, you know, and, and I don't know, other than the early season, uh, I'm not aware of an area on, on a Wisconsin river that has special regs anymore. Are there any special regs on any sections of streets? Obviously you are correct. It was bad timing. Uh, <laughs> there were special regs at that time on the Wolf River, for example. Right. Okay. 
Um, and there were special ranks of the prairie. We wanted to expand it and also have it be artificial lures only, right. and, uh, like trophy limits, 18 inches on brown. Right. And we gave it a good shot, but uh, they weren't buying it. And, uh, and it, with the exception of maybe one or two places, I'm not, in fact, I'm not even sure that that trophy section on the wolf even exists anymore. Yeah. So I yeah, think, it was bad timing. Yeah, I think uh, they're trying to simplify regulations and get rid of special rigs because maybe it's a headache, you know? It's like a money saving deal for them if the wardens don't have to, you know, check people in these special rigs areas. You know, they, yeah, they also said that uh, the, the, the special regs would be getting so uh, complicated that the average person who was buying a trout stamp couldn't understand it. Well, that's ridiculous because that's ridiculous. You know, they're, they're expected to be able to identify a duck in flight. And you can't tell me they, they don't know. They can't tell a brown from a brook from a rainbow trout when they know, you know when you're expecting duck hunters to be able to identify ducks that are flying over, which ones you can shoot and which ones you can't. So is that why they got rid of the, that's crazy to say that. Is that why they got rid of the point system for duck hunting? Because the people could not identify the difference between the various ducks? I don't know. I think so. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we tried. Yeah, oh. you did. You gave it a good fight. Um, we're getting down to, uh, <clears throat> we've now got, what, uh, 15 people here. We had actually 30-some people on, which is great. Really appreciate everybody showing up. Um, John, great idea. You get pat on the back for this and another raise in pay. So... <clears throat> <laughs> well, yeah, that's what, the raise and pay. Raise on, my... What's a raise on <laughs> nothing? You know? uh, yeah. yeah. So, so just a reminder, guys, you know, if you're in gals, yeah, on the 8th of May, uh, we will be, we'll bring it, we're going to, we got a thousand trees to plant. We have uh, the Green Bay uh, chapters coming in to assist with it. So we're hosting them. Um, so if you, if you have an idea that you might be able to attend, uh, uh, please do so. Um, it, it's pretty open. All you need is a set of waiters, and if you can bring a shovel, that, that'd be good, too. Uh, meals will be provided, and uh, at lunch, uh, courtesy of the chapter, uh, we'll try to do it as uh, safe and socially distanced as we possibly can in what we're doing. So, And uh, you go right on the website, w, uh, w, yeah, wisconsinrivervalleytu.org, and uh, there's a there's a whole description of what's going to be done and directions to it. So, other than that, wow. hey guys, uh, just a, a side note on that for anybody, Degas Road to get back into the parking lot is is uh, a road that needs maybe some work for some people to get down it. If you have a four wheel drive, you're fine, or if you've got a a vehicle with a fairly, you know good uh, axle distance, you're, you're probably fine. <clears throat> but we are gonna set it up with the Green Bay chapter and a few of our members that are gonna be there that uh, if they, somebody really needs a shuttle because they don't wanna risk it, we'll figure out a way to get them back there. So as John said, you get on our website, there's a sign up and uh, we look forward to having a lot of people out there to help out get those trees planted. And the DNR is supposed to provide uh, tree spikes to help plant. So bring a shovel, bring waders just in case. My chat thing froze up. So let me say it was a wonderful evening, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That being said, I think we should end this and thanks everybody once again for coming and hope you had a good evening. Good night. Guys, really enjoyed it. Good.
And and most of it was true, I think. Yeah. 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 Even the part that John talked about. <laughs> All stories are true and some are even accurate, so that's how it goes. So <laughs> As Thank I've said before, much. the lawyers, the lawyers were to tell you the, the facts, while interesting, are irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. good to see you here tonight, Eddie, too. So. All right. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Good night.